Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining me for today's grill. My name is Jeff Sperry, the PGY2 in internal medicine. Excited to talk to you guys today about corals over orals, oral beta lactams for gram negative bloodstream infections. And a big thank you to the content expert, Brian Buss, and all of your help on this presentation. Don't forget to sign in. The CE code is displayed there at the bottom. Oh, we'll also have this at the end. So we'll go ahead and get started. The overarching goal for today's grill is to help you identify some clinical scenarios in terms of what types of patients and what microbiologic characteristics that might be suitable for using oral beta-lactams as step-down therapy when treating patients who have a gram-negative bloodstream infection according to best available evidence. The presentation will be split up into three sections. The first section will discuss the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of beta-lactams and fluoroquinolones when treating bloodstream infections. The pharmacokinetics are really going to be essential when considering whether we would expect an antibiotic to be effective for treating a particular type of infection. And it will really help us kind of lay the foundation for the rest of the talk. In the second section, we'll evaluate the primary literature for oral beta-lactam use in gram-negative bloodstream infections. There have been several retrospective studies as well as a meta-analysis, and we'll look at a couple of those. And then finally, in part three, we'll kind of bring it all together based off of our discussion of the pharmacokinetics and the primary literature. So summarize some criteria to consider when evaluating your patients for whether they might be appropriate for oral beta-lactam therapy, really in order to optimize the pharmacokinetics and reflect what was done in the literature. As a quick bit of background, gram-negative bloodstream infections, they occur at a rate of about 50 cases per 100,000 person years. This rate has been increasing. It's more than tripled from 1985 to 2006. And in large part, this is due to a growing proportion from a nosocomial sources of infections of 20% and increasing bacteremias due to a nosocomial source. And this carries with it a fairly significant case fatality rate of about 13.5%. So gram-negative bloodstream infections, they are serious infections that carry this fairly, fairly important fatality rate, and it's important to treat them appropriately. The most common causative organisms are going to be far and away the E. coli and Klebsiella being the most common, but Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, Protease also playing an important role. And the most common sources of bacteremia, urinary source far and away being the most common, but also intra-abdominal and central line associated infections playing an important role, pulmonary skin and soft tissue a little less common. In terms of standard treatment options, our most commonly used and most efficacious classes of antibiotics are going to be the beta-lactams and fluoroquinolones. And this will we'll dive into that first section of the presentation in considering the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics of these two classes of antibiotics. Focusing first on the beta-lactams, we know that efficacy of beta-lactams really depends upon the PKPD parameter of time above MIC where we want free drug concentration to be above the MIC for the longest duration of time. And in a classic example of this, in looking at an animal model, this was neutropenic mice who were infected with Klebsiella pneumoniae and then treated with cefotaxime. The bacterial burden, which was measured in log CFU, is graphed on the y-axis, and this was compared to several different PKPD parameters. In graph A, that log CFU is compared to a peak to MIC ratio, and there's no clear relationship that emerges here, where even if we were to greatly increase our peak to MIC ratio, there's not necessarily a large decrease in bacterial burden or log CFU. Similarly, in graph B, when we look at log CFU compared to AUC to MIC ratio, again, no clear relationship, even if we increase that AUC to MIC ratio, not necessarily a large decrease in log CFU. But finally, in graph C, when we look at the PKPD parameter of time above MIC, a very clear relationship emerges, 
where once MI, time above MIC exceeds about 40 to 50 percent, we see a large decrease in long CFU. And this is particularly important for our serious infections, like a gram-negative bloodstream infection, where we really want to optimize our PKPD parameters. Because when we fail to hit our PKPD target, we risk seeing very poor clinical outcomes. As an example of this, this is looking at time above MIC compared to mortality. And this was an animal model, but obviously mortality and an important clinical outcome. And we see that when time above MIC is quite low, mortality approaches 80 to 100%. But once we optimize that PKPD and at time above MIC exceeds at 40, 50% range, mortality drops off approaching 0%. Again, animal model, but illustrating the importance of hitting our PKPD targets for these serious infections. In terms of when we consider a route of administration and how that affects this all important parameter of a time above MIC, in order to maximize that time above MIC, it's ideal to administer beta-lactams intravenously. You can give a lot more drug IV, whereas when you give antibiotics orally or beta-lactams, orally, you're really limited by absorption. And this is a big burden to overcome. You have to give big doses of oral beta-lactams in order to achieve adequate serum concentrations. But when you give these big oral doses, you're also severely limited by side effects, especially things like GI upset and diarrhea. So it's a lot easier to optimize our PKPD when giving beta-lactams intravenously. And as you are well familiar with, we can also administer beta-lactams via extended infusion to really take advantage and optimize time above MIC. Obviously not necessarily a dosing regimen that we can replicate when we give beta-lactams orally. To sort of further illustrate this point, looking at time versus concentration curve, of oral cephalexin versus IV cefazolin. If we are to give a gram of cephalexin orally, then our serum concentrations would look something like this, where we get a peak after about an hour, that peak being about 32, with a half-life of about a half hour, our serum concentrations drop off relatively quickly. Compare this to if we are to give a gram of cefazolin intravenously, our concentrations look something like this, where we'll get a peak of about 185, and with a half-life of about two hours, serum concentrations stick around a lot longer. So obviously this is a pretty drastic difference in terms of concentrations when giving oral versus IV beta-lactams. But serum concentrations only tell half of the story. The other key piece of information is how this serum concentration compares to the MIC of the organism that we're targeting. According to Mandel's, the MIC for 50% of E. coli isolates for cephalexin is 8. With an MIC 50 of 8, time above MIC looks something like this. Whereas the MIC 50 for cefazolin for E. coli is 2 which would, with an MIC of two, give us a time above MIC that looks something like this. So again, this is a pretty drastic difference between oral cephalexin and IV cefazolin. And this is why IV beta-lactams really are standard of care. And remembering, when we fail to hit our PKPD targets, we risk seeing important clinical outcomes, such as higher mortality in our animal models. So we talked about beta-lactams, we'll switch gears now and talk about fluoroquinolones. And we know that efficacy of fluoroquinolones is really dependent upon this PKPD parameter of AUC to MIC ratio. So more of an exposure-based drug. Classic example of this is looking at AUC to MIC compared to animal mortality, where we see when AUC to MIC is quite low, mortality very high, but once we optimize that AUC to MIC, once it exceeds about 80 to 125, then the mortality significantly drops off. Again, most important for our serious infections, like a gram-negative bloodstream infection, where we really want to hit our PKPD target. 
In terms of route of administration, because fluoroquinolones have much better oral bioavailability, and also because they depend on this AUC to MIC ratio and not on this time above MIC, we do not face nearly the same limitations when we give fluoroquinolones orally as when we give beta-lactams orally. Looking at this example of time versus concentration curve for oral versus IV ciprofloxacin, if we were to give 500 milligrams ciprofloxacin orally, our concentrations look like this. We get a 12-hour AUC of about 13.7. Compare this to if we were to give an equivalent dose of ciprofloxacin IV, 400 milligrams IV, then we get concentrations that will look sort of like this in blue with a 12 hour AUC of 12.7. So these AUCs are very similar between oral and IV routes of administration. And this is why oral fluoroquinolones are much more commonly used and a reliable option for treating our gram-negative bloodstream infections. There are times, however, when using fluoroquinolones warrants caution. Other than, of course, your standard precautions with fluoroquinolones where you're concerned about things like increased risk for C. diff, QTC prolongation, tendonitis, tendon rupture, peripheral neuropathy, all your black box warnings. But in addition to that, the PKPD concern with fluoroquinolones occurs when the MIC of a particular isolate approaches the breakpoint. So to illustrate this a little bit further, here is an example of looking at ciprofloxacin 500 milligrams given orally every 12 hours. On the x-axis is MIC for enterobacterialis, so previously enterobacteriaceae, ranging from an MIC of less than 0.03 to an MIC greater than 4. On the y-axis is percent PK PD target attainment. And there are several different curves. The far left curve in red with the open red squares represents two log CFU decline. So bacterial killing activity. There are sort of two curves overlaid in the middle, a blue curve and a red curve with the open red triangles. That blue curve represents PKPD target attainment. That red curve with the open red triangles represents a one log CFU decline. And then on the far right is a red curve with open red circles representing net bacterial stasis, so bacteriostatic activity. If we were to have an isolate with an MIC of, let's say, 0.06, then about 100% of the time we'd be getting bacterial stasis, as well as about 100% of the time getting log CFU decline, so getting both bacteriostatic and bactericidal activity. With an MIC of 0.25, we're still getting about 100% of the time net bacterial stasis, but only about 50% of the time are we getting any log CFU decline, any bacterial killing. So still bacterial stasis, but far less bacterial killing. And then if we have an MIC of say 0.5, then only 50% of the time are we getting any bacterial stasis and about 0% of the time getting any log CFU decline, any bacterial killing. The Relatively new CLSI breakpoints for fluoroquinolones for ciprofloxacin for enterobacterialis, an MIC of 0.25 or less is considered susceptible. An MIC of 0.5 is considered intermediate, and an MIC of 1 or greater is considered resistant. Now, the purpose of this slide is to illustrate the danger that occurs when using fluoroquinolones when your MIC approaches the breakpoint. So breakpoint being MIC of 0.25. So for example, we have an E. coli MIC 0.25. We are still getting about 100% bacterial stasis, but only about 50% any bacterial killing. So we're right on the edge. And if anything changes with your patient, if there's any changes in volume of distribution or any increase in clearance of drug and you fail to hit your PKPD target, then there's a much higher risk of treatment failure. Also taking into consideration that the acceptable margin of error when determining an MIC is plus or minus one dilution. So a reported MIC of 0.25 could in actuality be anywhere between 0.12 all the way up to 0.5. And if we have that MIC of 0.5, again, maybe only about 50% of the time getting any bacterial stasis, about 0% of the time getting any bacterial killing. So again, when the MIC approaches the breakpoint, this is one clinical scenario that 
using fluoroquinolones warrants caution and it might strongly favor the use of a beta lactam. So we talked about fluoroquinolones and beta lactams, oral versus IV. Next, we're going to jump a little bit deeper into the PK and PD of oral beta lactams in particular. Again, beta lactams, that time above MIC being so important. So the question that we'll address next is what would we expect to be able to achieve adequate time above MIC when we administer beta lactams orally? In 2019, Mogul and colleagues published a nice paper that contained a pharmacokinetic modeling looking at various oral beta lactams given at different dosing regimens displayed here. And the purpose was to determine what would the MIC have to be in order for us to be able to hit our PKPD target with the oral beta lactams. So, for example, we have amoxicillin 500 milligrams given every eight hours. If the MIC is eight, then about 13% of the time, serum concentrations would be above the MIC. Obviously, 13% of the time above the MIC is very low. We remember for penicillins like amoxicillin and amoxicillin clavulinate, our goal percent time above MIC is going to be at least 50% of the time. So as we move along the table and the MIC decreases, the percent time above MIC increases until we hit an MIC of 0.5 or less. At this point, we hit that magic number and our percent time above MIC exceeds 50%. Similarly, for the other antibiotics and dosing regimens displayed here, highlighted is what the MIC would have to be in order for us to hit our PKPD target of at least 50% time above MIC. Now, this pharmacokinetic model does have a number of assumptions. The one component model assuming average bioavailability of these antibiotics in a 70 kilogram patient with assuming the longest possible half-life for these different antibiotics. So consider your patients that might have lower bioavailability due to physiological reasons, or they're a lot larger than 70 kilograms, or if they have a shorter half-life or even just a normal half-life. Uh, let's say they have excellent renal function and they're clearing drug a lot more quickly. As such, the estimates provided here in this table are really rather generous and should be used with caution, especially if there's anything about your patient that would lead you to believe that their pharmacokinetics would not fit the assumptions of this model. Going back to our example, amoxicillin 500 milligrams every eight hours, assuming you know, that 70 kilogram patient longest possible half-life. If the MIC is 0.5 or less, we may be able to hit our PKPD target. But what are typical MICs? How reasonable is it that we would see an MIC of 0.5 or less? Well, according to Mandel's, which is based on several large surveillance studies, the average MICs for our two most common gram-negative pathogens, E. coli and Klebsiella pneumoniae for amoxicillin are displayed here, mean MIC for E. coli greater than 200, mean MIC for Klebsiella pneumoniae 50. So as you can tell, these mean MICs are drastically higher than the MICs where we might expect to be able to hit our PKPD target according to this pharmacokinetic model. Even if we were to increase the dose of amoxicillin to 1,000 milligrams, every eight hours, still quite a big difference between these two MICs. Similarly, looking at amoxicillin and clavulinate dosed every eight hours, when MIC is 0.5 or less, we might be able to hit our PKPD target, but mean MIC for E. coli for amoxicillin clavulinate is four, for Klebsiella pneumoniae, it's two. So highlighted in yellow boxes are the MICs that we might typically see in clinical practice. Highlighted in the red boxes are what the MICs that we may be able to hit according to this pharmacokinetic model. And note that the boxes do not overlap. Similarly, if we were to look at our oral cephalosporins, remembering for cephalosporins, our goal percent time above MIC is gonna be at least 60% of the time or higher, which we can achieve with cephalexin 500 milligrams every six hours when the MIC is two or less. If we increase that dose to 1,000 milligrams, we can achieve it when MIC is four or less. 
We cannot achieve it for cefiroxime or ceftonir, any of the MICs displayed on this table, and we can achieve it for a cefpodoxime when the MIC is 0.25 or less, but only when the cefpodoxime is given at that higher dose of 400 milligrams every 12 hours. Again, this is the same assumptions are mean bioavailability, 70 kilogram patient, the longest possible half-life. I think that longest possible half-life assumption is especially critical. There's can be a lot of variability in the half lives of these agents. For example, the half life of cephalexin can range anywhere from a half hour to 1.5 hours, which is a threefold difference. So, if we were to change this up and instead look at the shortest half life for these different agents, well, if we were to use the shortest half life, then cephalexin actually falls off the map and we're unable to achieve meaningful time above MIC for any of the MICs listed on this table. And kind of similarly to what we looked at before with amoxicillin, amoxicillin clavulinate, what are typical MICs? According to Anna Mandels, the MIC for 50% of strains for cephalexin for E. coli and Clemsiella pneumoniae is 8, which according to our pharmacokinetic model, not something that we would expect to be able to achieve adequate time above MIC. Same thing for cefuroxine, ceftonir, not MICs that we would expect to be able to achieve according to our pharmacokinetic model. And finally, for cefpodoxine, when our MIC is 0.25 or less, we might be able to hit our PKA PD target, which is reasonable given that the MIC 50 for E. coli is also 0.25. Again, highlighted here in yellow boxes is what the MICs that we might typically see in clinical practice. Highlighted in green is the only instance of overlap where we may be able, to be able to hit this according to our pharmacokinetic model. So really kind of to summarize this, it's really difficult to achieve adequate time above MIC with these oral beta-lactams just due to their lower oral bioavailability and also because of their shorter half-lives. And this is still why IV beta-lactams are standard of care. Now, I did want to give you a quick look at what susceptibilities might look like in HealthLink now that we've been talking so much about MICs. This is an example of a Klebsiella pneumoniae bloodstream infection. And a couple of things to note. First, susceptibilities for oral beta-lactams generally are not reported, uh, with the exception of amoxicillin clavulinate, although there is this note that amoxicillin clavulinate is not preferred for bloodstream infections. Second, we're only provided with whether it's susceptible or resistant. We're not provided with the actual MICs. However, what we just saw earlier in those tables, knowing the actual MIC might be really helpful, that we might only be able to hit our PKPD target when the MIC is sufficiently low enough. Third, just because a isolate is susceptible to an IV beta-lactam does not necessarily mean it's susceptible to an oral beta-lactam. For example, susceptibility to IV cefazolin doesn't necessarily mean susceptibility to oral cephalexin. The MICs are different for cefazolin, for Klebsiella pneumoniae, it's two, for cephalexin, it's eight. So really the purpose of checking susceptibilities is to make sure that they look reasonable. And obviously, if it's resistant to IV beta-lactams, then we probably want to steer clear of using oral beta-lactams. So this was a big section on PKPD. Just to briefly summarize, we talked about the importance of time above MIC for beta-lactams, and especially the importance of hitting our PKPD target for these serious infections, like a gram-negative bloodstream infection. We saw why giving beta-lactams intravenously really optimizes that time above MIC. We saw that drastic difference between oral cephalexin versus IV cefazolin, whereas for fluoroquinolones, we do not we're not faced with nearly the same limitations when we give fluoroquinolones orally. And finally, in that pharmacokinetic model, we saw that, you know, given the typical MICs that we usually see, most oral beta-lactams, we might not expect to be able to achieve adequate time above MIC. So really, in summary, from a PKPD perspective, the case for oral beta-lactams does not seem very promising. But what's so fascinating about this topic is that this is sort of in a stark contrast to what we see in the primary literature. 
And that's where we're headed next, looking at oral beta-lactams in the literature. Now, all of the studies that we have to date are retrospective in nature. We will look at the two largest retrospective studies, and we'll also look at one meta-analysis. Our first retrospective study is a cohort analysis. It was published in 2019 by Tana and colleagues. And they looked at 1,478 patients with an Enterobacter valis bloodstream infection. These patients received a median of three days of IV antibiotics, after which half of them went on to continue receiving IV an antibiotics. The other half were switched over and stepped down to oral antibiotics to complete their course of therapy. Again, retrospective in nature, observational, without random assignment, but patients were propensity score matched in a one-to-one -one fashion. At the time of oral step-down, patients had to be receiving enteral food and medications. They had to have source control for their bacteremia, and they had to have a, bit, a pit bacteremia score of one or less. The pit bacteremia score is a scale of zero to 14 with a higher number indicating higher severity of illness. And the scoring is displayed here. So with a score of one or less, these patients, they generally were not febrile. They were not hypotensive, not mechanically ventilated, didn't have altered mental status. So really, bottom line, and they were clinically quite stable and doing pretty well by the time they were, were receiving oral antibiotics. The patient demographics are displayed here. Of note, about 21% originally admitted to the ICU. About a quarter of them had diabetes and only a handful were immunocompromised. Key exclusion criteria included a polymicrobial bloodstream infection, or if patients received a very short or a very long course of total antibiotics. The most common causative microorganisms, E. coli and Klebsiella, sort of as expected, are most common microbes that were isolated in terms of infectious source. Same thing kind of as expected, urinary source being the most common, gastrointestinal, central line associated, and biliary also playing important roles. And I wanted to give you an idea of the doses that were used. So of patients who received oral antibiotics, 17% received oral beta-lactams. So this was pretty low numbers. And for certain subgroups, the numbers were even fewer. For example, patients who were immunocompromised and received oral beta-lactams, there's only 25 patients in total. And also take a look at the doses that were given. Kind of in line with our earlier discussion from about the PK and PD, some of these regimens like the septonir, cephalexin, are regimens that we wouldn't necessarily expect to be able to achieve adequate time above MIC. So these are not necessarily optimized regimens of oral beta lactams either. Whereas we have our about 70% of patients received oral fluoroquinolones and about 13% of patients received oral sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim at relatively standard doses displayed here. All patients received a median of 14 days of total antibiotics. And in terms of the outcomes, the primary analysis for this study looked at oral versus IV antibiotics. But there was a nice subgroup analysis that looked at just that group of patients that received oral antibiotics. And they looked at those who received low bioavailability, which would be our oral beta-lactams, compared to high bioavailability, which would be our oral fluoroquinones and oral sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim. In terms of recurrent bacteremia at 30 days in the low bioavailability group, 0% versus 0.6% in the high bioavailability group. Now, these event rates were very low in the study of lacked high statistical power, but there was no statistically significant difference between these two groups, which seems to indicate, maybe a little bit surprisingly even, that as long as patients are clinically stable and they have adequate source control, there did not seem to be a meaningful difference in terms of recurrent bacteremia when giving oral beta-lactams. Looking at our second retrospective cohort study, this was published by Sutton and colleagues in 2020. This is our largest study that we have to date. It comes out of the VA. They looked at over 4,000 patients with an enterobacter valis bloodstream infection. Of note, 100% of these were all urinary in source. 
patients received a median of four and a half days of IV antibiotics, after which one group was switched over to oral beta-lactams, whereas the other group was switched over to oral fluoroquinolones, oral sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim. Again, retrospective observational in nature without random assignments, but treatment groups were relatively well balanced using inverse probability of treatment weighting. When patients first were started on IV antibiotics, about 17% were in ICU and the majority were febrile and had an elevated white count. But by the time they were stepped down to oral antibiotics, very few were in ICU and fever, elevated white count were largely resolved. So again, patients were doing pretty well, clinically stable at the time of receiving oral antibiotics. Patient demographics displayed here. This is very representative of the VA population of older white males, 91% males, about 20% originally admitted to the ICU, pretty low Charles and comorbidity index, and only 6%, very few were immunocompromised. Key exclusion criteria included polymicrobial bloodstream infection, urologic abscess, chronic prostatitis, or within the past year, another enterobacterialis bloodstream infection. Microbiologic characteristics as expected, E. coli being the most common of note, there were no spice or space organisms, so none of these inducible AMC producing pathogens. And as mentioned earlier, 100% were urinary in source. The dosing used of patients who received oral antibiotics, 23% received oral beta-lactams at the doses displayed here. Again, according to our PKP discussion earlier, some of these, the cephalexin, cefuroxime, amoxicillin, septinir, not regimens that we would really expect to be able to achieve adequate time above MIC. So again, not optimized doses of oral beta-lactams compared to 70% of patients who received an oral fluoroquinolone, 7% of patients who received an oral sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim. Again, pretty standard doses displayed here. And patients also received a median of 14 days of antibiotics in total. In terms of outcomes, looking at recurrent bacteremia at 30 days, 1.5% in the oral beta-lactam group versus 0.4% in the oral fluoroquinolone, oral sulfamethoxazole trimethoprim group. So numerically, there was almost a fourfold higher rate of recurrent bacteremia in the oral beta-lactam group, but this difference was not statistically significant. Similarly, at 90 days, 2.6% in the oral beta-lactam group versus 1.1%, again, numerically, a over twofold higher rate of recurrence in the oral beta lactam group, but this difference also was not statistically significant. So we see perhaps maybe this numeric trend towards higher rates of recurrent bacteremia in our oral beta lactam group, but this and even our largest study, over 4,000 patients, these rates were so small, these differences were so small, they were not statistically significant, or I would also argue not clinically meaningful. So really, uh, I would conclude that, you know, among VA patients that they are given that they're stable and with this bloodstream infection from a urinary source, that there did not appear to be a meaningful difference in rates of recurrent bacteremia when we used oral beta lactams. And finally, looking at our meta-analysis, this was published in 2019 by Pujabi and colleagues, systematic review and meta-analysis that looked at studies that compared oral beta-lactams versus oral fluoroquinolone, sulfamethoxyl, trimethoprim, and had an outcome of either all-cause mortality or infection recurrence. They ultimately included eight studies. All of these are retrospective in nature, encompassing about 2,200 patients. Of note, this did include the TAMA study. It did not include the Sutton study. So it did not include those 4,000 patients from the Sutton study. When looking at a recurrent bacteremia, probably the most relevant outcome that they evaluated, this occurred 1.9% in the oral beta-lactam group versus 0.9% in the oral fluoroquinolone group. That confidence interval, it does cross one, so no statistically significant difference between the two, although there was this trend towards favoring fluoroquinolones. And I think this really 
mirrors kind of what we saw in the Sutton article, where we saw this trend towards favoring colloquial or this trend perhaps towards higher rates of recurrent bacteremia with an oral beta lactams, but that difference was very small and not statistically significant different. So in this pool analysis of eight retrospective studies, no difference in recurrent bacteremia when we used oral beta lactams. Did want to mention real quickly, what about immunocompromised patients in these studies? Well, really, there was very low rates in the Sutton and in the Tama studies. There was less than 6% of patients were immunocompromised. Of those who were immunocompromised and received oral antibiotics, over 80% of them received oral fluoroquinolones. So just a group that we still don't have very much data on. So really to summarize this second section, looking at the primary literature, oral beta-lactams versus oral fluoroquinolones, we saw from these two large retrospective cohort studies that there was no difference in rates of recurrent bacteremia. And in that meta-analysis of several smaller, lower to moderate quality studies, also no difference in rates of recurrent bacteremia. So sort of in stark contrast to our earlier discussion of PKPD concerns with oral beta lactams. In these studies, oral beta lactams actually seem to perform relatively well. There is perhaps this numerical trend towards higher rates of recurrence in the oral beta lactam group, but that difference was not statistically significant or clinically meaningful. So, really, bottom line, studies do seem to show, our retrospective studies so far, that oral beta lactams may be a feasible option provided that certain conditions are met. And that's what we'll talk about in the third section. What are those conditions? What types of patients, what clinical scenarios might it be appropriate to use oral beta lactams? And my goal for this is really to help provide you with some concrete criteria that you can consider when evaluating your patients that's reflective of what was done in the literature. So first, patients should have a functional GI tract, a diet should be ordered, they should be tolerating oral medications, and no anticipated issues with absorption of oral medications. There should be an acceptable risk of non-optimized dosing. We spent, again, a lot of time talking about how the PKPD of oral beta lactams is not necessarily ideal, that it's really difficult to achieve adequate time above MIC with oral beta lactams, given the MICs that we typically see and the doses that we usually use for oral beta lactams. And it's also a little bit risky using these agents where we cannot reliably hit our PK PD targets. As such, it's important to carefully select which patients are appropriate to receive oral beta lactams. Really, these should be patients who have adequate source control, so there should not be an ongoing nidus of infection that might be difficult to mop up with oral beta lactams alone. Patients should be clinically stable. In studies, this meant that they were largely afebrile, had a normal or downtrending blood cell count, they were out of the ICU, they were hemodynamically stable, they did not have altered mental status. Patients should receive a sufficient duration of IV antibiotics before stepping down to oral antibiotics. In studies, patients generally received at least three to five days of IV antibiotics before being switched over. And exercise caution if your patients are immunocompromised. Again, not a group that we have a lot of data on, as well as, you know, you have on the one hand your antibiotics that you cannot reliably hit your PKPD target, and on the other hand, a patient's immune system that on its own might not be the best for being able to clear up an infection, and that's when you could really run into some trouble. Selecting patients that you would expect to be adherent, where a lot of these dosing regimens of oral beta lactams are dosed two times, three times, maybe even four times a day. So patients who are able to do that, expect to be adherent, willing to do that, and who are also available for close follow-up in case uh, things get worse or they fail to improve. And finally, is there a compelling reason to avoid alternatives? IV beta lactams and fluoroquinolones still remain your therapy of choice, but is there a compelling reason why we can't use those? We talked about earlier the example of when the danger occurs with fluoroquinolones when the MIC approaches the breakpoint might be one clinical scenario that would strongly favor the use of beta lactams. If you are using oral beta lactams, make sure that you check susceptibilities. And really here, just making sure that susceptibilities seem reasonable. And dose those oral beta lactams aggressively. Consider higher non-standard dosing 
dose to the maximum tolerated with the understanding that you may be limited by side effects, especially GI upset, diarrhea, and that you still may not be achieving optimal PK, PD with these agents. And so just to kind of summarize briefly our discussion today for GRILL, in part one, we looked at how the PK, PD of oral beta-lactams, it's not ideal. But in part two, we saw in the primary literature that actually oral beta-lactams did seem to perform relatively well. So in part three, really the key here is given these PKPD concerns, important to carefully select which patients receive oral beta-lactam therapy. And we have to be thoughtful about it and we have to be maybe a little bit cautious about which patients we use. And that's really the key takeaway for today's grill is assess your patient. Assess your patient, some things to consider when you know the, the provider or the team asks you, hey, can we send this person home on an oral beta-lactam? Thinking about, are they clinically stable? Do we have source control? Did they get a sufficient course of IV antibiotics first? Looking at susceptibilities, do they seem reasonable? Is your patient immunocompetent? Was it a urinary source? This is just where we have the most data. We also know that beta-lactams concentrate very well in the urine no anticipated issues with absorption. So really, we kind of know that uh, oral beta-lactams, they might not necessarily be the most ideal agent for this type of infection, but in some circumstances, you might be able to get by. So when can you get away with using duct tape? And that's sort of the informal title of today's grill. When can you use duct tape? So uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for your time and attention. We are just gonna wrap up with a few patient cases to assess your understanding. Patient case number one, this is CD. She's a 63-year-old female, originally admitted for pyelonephritis, subsequently, unfortunately, found to have E. coli on her blood cultures. She's been receiving ceftriaxone, today is day five. Her vital signs are listed here as well as some pertinent labs, and we got susceptibilities on that E. coli. So the question for you, does the literature support using oral beta-lactams for this patient? And you can enter your answers into the chat box. Okay, so I'm seeing some A's, some yeses, I'm seeing some C's, um, probably fine, normal weight, and iffy kidneys are on our side, I think that's a good point, C, A, okay, maybe some concerns about the, the renal function, so Answer here is A. I think I think C could also be reasonable as well. It still is a gray area and a, and a controversial area. And really this, other than the fact that she's female, this is basically a Sutton patient. She has a urinary source of infection. She's received an adequate course of IV antibiotics. So today's day five of ceftriaxone. Looking at her vital signs, she's afebrile, hemodynamically stable. Her white cell count is downtrending quite nicely. Um, a couple of people mentioned, uh, you know, maybe some concern about the cranial clearance. I guess I, I apologize. Let's assume that this is like her baseline, her, her normal. A lot of our oral beta-lactams might not necessarily need to adjust until cranial clearance is less than 30. Um, but I'm like that we're, we're thinking about the um, cramming clearance. And I think someone had also mentioned that actually maybe that was iffy kidneys might be on our side. And that's definitely true where 
if our you know cramming clearance is way high and patients are clearing drug a lot more quickly, then we might not be able to hit our PK PV as easily. So actually, that might be again kind of on our side that uh, that their cramming clearance is only about fifty four. Susceptibilities, looking at susceptibilities, those seem reasonable. So I think yes, this might be a patient that we could consider in the right circumstance that an oral beta lactam could possibly be used. Patient case number two, and this is basically the exact same patient. I'll just point out the only difference here is the uh, susceptibility pattern. So in this case, does the literature support using oral beta lactams for this patient? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of B's. I see a C as well. So for the sake of argument, we could say we could say C. I definitely think B is a reasonable option as well. Given this pattern of susceptibility, that's definitely could be concerning. This pattern of resistance and intermediate for some of these other beta lactams definitely concerning. And I think you know safest option steering clear of oral beta lactams and in its entirety could definitely be an acceptable option. For the sake of argument, we could say maybe. It is susceptible to ceftriaxone, a third generation cephalosporin. Potentially, you could use cefpidoxime, another third generation cephalosporin. Cefpidoxime was used in the TANA article and in the Sutton article, which did find that the oral beta lactams seem to perform reasonably well. However, keeping in mind that the susceptibilities of MICs for E. coli, for ceftriaxone, and for cefpidoxine, they are a bit different, and we don't know for certain with cefpidoxine. So kind of a, kind of a gray area. So thanks for <laughs> participating. I think C and B are both completely reasonable options here. And finally, patient case number three, again, basically the exact same patient. Uh, only difference is that she had a kidney transplant relatively recently in November. For this situation, does the literature support using oral beta lactams for this patient? Okay, so I'm seeing B's and C's. Um, so I think both of those are very, very reasonable options. I said maybe. Uh, the reason is that there were some immunocompromised patients included in the Sutton and in the TAMA studies, although the numbers were very, very low. So maybe our, our safest option is steering clear of oral beta lactams in this group. It's true that we really don't have a lot of information, although you could maybe make the argument that there was still a few immunocompromised patients that received oral beta lactams in those two studies, um, although we didn't have great information on how that subgroup performed in particular. All right, well, again, thank you everyone for your participation in the patient case and for your attendance today. Again, that CE code is listed on the slide. Also, more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Jeff, it's, it's Brian. Um, great job. Thanks for putting this together. Want to ask your um, your thoughts and perspective on um, why there's this discrepancy between modeling and what our clinical data shows in the studies? Like, how do you explain that it works, essentially? <laughs> 
Yeah, that's an excellent question because we, we did talk about, you know, from a PKPD perspective, like it doesn't make sense. It doesn't seem like they should work. But then we have these pretty large, you know, like a sudden study, 4,000 patients that seem to show, hey, it actually might be a reasonable option, or at least these patients didn't necessarily crash and burn. And so a, a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one, maybe really the key that's most important is really just source control and an adequate course of IV antibiotics. Maybe that's really what's doing like the heavy lifting here and is the most important. Maybe the oral beta lactams aren't really doing a, a whole lot Otherwise, that could be one potential uh, one potential explanation. Another could be, you know, we've been seeing additional literature showing shorter and shorter courses of antibiotics. So, like, uh, or in terms of gram-negative bloodstream infections, literature showing seven days being not inferior to fourteen days. Maybe like is five days just as good as seven days? And maybe these patients who got five days of IV antibiotics, they were essentially cured after five days. Um, maybe that's something like that. We uh, maybe another explanation is also that the um, oral beta lactams, even though we don't hit our PKPD target 100% of the time, there's still maybe this window where they might be having some effect. So it might not be time of an IC, you know, at least 50% of the time, but maybe like 20 or 30, 40% of the time, maybe we're getting some time of MIC. And so it's still having a little bit of effect, especially if. IV antibiotics did kind of the heavy lifting and then some oral beta lactams to kind of mop up anything that might be left over. Uh, also, we saw a lot of this evidence was for a urinary source, so we know that beta lactams concentrate quite well in the urine, so maybe that's also part of it. I think really we bottom line, we we don't know for certain, but those are a few of my thoughts potentially explaining that discrepancy. Yeah, so excellent question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any additional questions? Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for attending today. This will wrap up today's grill session and we will see you next week. Thank you everybody.